Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Run Leagues Club for the meeting of the candidates today for the federal election 2022. Uh, thank you very much for joining us if you're watching at home. Thank you very much for doing that. We will be very entertained by these wonderful people from Ryan and Dixon in the next half hour or so. We'll have questions from the floor as well. And uh, we're all on time, as you're on time with your busy schedule at home, so we're going to get on the way with the uh, Dixon uh, electorate and candidate number one who will be speaking this morning. So number one has been drawn by ballot and Dixon was chosen by ballot as well before we went to the video. So would candidate number one please uh, take the microphone. And I believe it is, candidate number one is Alina. Uh, Alina Ward is representing the United Australia Party. Alina, your two minutes starts when you get on your feet and start. Awesome. Morning, everybody. My name's Alina Ward. I'm representing the United Australia Party for Dixon. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Zebra. Um, I'm an ex dairy farmer. Uh, I grew up working the land alongside my family. Um, it was a beautiful lifestyle, which tragically has, is, is being destroyed. Um, they were, had 36 dairy farms, it's now down to one. And that was because of the introduction of the deregulation laws, which saw basically all the dairy farms shut down around Australia. Um, what's left is next to nothing, and we import a lot of our milk now. So I guess I've always had a little bit of a bee in my bonnet towards Liberal because they, they closed down a lot of agricultural and dairy farming industries and they left the farmers to fend for themselves. I mean, the farmer's suicide rate went through the roof. People had their lifestyles ripped out from underneath them. Um, and the government just moves on as if nothing has happened. Um, so that's, that's a little bit what we're experiencing right at this moment as well, um, with all these mandates and lockdowns that we've been going through. People have been forced into positions they don't feel comfortable in, they're not happy with, they're being forced to put things into their bodies that they don't agree with. And while a lot of people will say, oh, they're not forced, there's a choice. When you're threatened with your job, when you're stopped from seeing your family, when you're threatened to be locked out of social activities, it's a threat. And our government is literally terrorising our people. And I think it's time that we change that. If we need a change, and we need to introduce freedom back to our people. And again, not everybody has lost their freedom in their eyes, but a lot of us have. I personally have been mandated. I was put down for the three jobs. Is that 10 seconds? No, that's, that's 30 seconds. Oh, okay. That is 10 seconds. Um, that is 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Oh, that's okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm here for free notes. Um, and I just, we have, a, we have a great policy and, and a great economic plan to bring Australia back to be better. And the main thing is to stop the mandates, give everybody back their rights, introduce a bill of rights so they can't be taken again. Because families are on their knees at the moment, people are struggling, people have lost their homes and their businesses. Thank you, Alina. Alina Wood from the United States. Thank you, Alina. First of the rank. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a 10 second bell. It's not very bad. You have the big plane there? See you, lady. <laughs> All right. Uh, for Ryan now, the, for, who's drawn number one for Ryan? No. <laughs> 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 Whoever wants to do it. <laughs> Axel, the Koisner, uh, representing the Australian Party. Good morning, everybody. I don't know what you've got. We get organised eventually. So good morning, everybody. And uh, yes, I represent the Australian Federation Party. I'm quite new to this. You will find out soon. But I'm learning, learning the ropes. Originally, I was born in France. Everybody's perfect. Okay. I was. I knew you guys. I was naturalised in 1975, thanks to my granddad who moved here. And due to, thanks to the Australian policy, work on Australian policy in the, in the 50s. He became Australian in 56, gave it to my, my dad. And uh, when my dad decided to bring me to Australia to meet my granddad for the first time, so he sent me, got the papers right, and uh, I guess he said, well, here's Australia. Yeah. So 
So I was given my passport there and uh, discovered the beaches of uh, Sydney, Manor Beach, mostly, Curl Curl, Bondi. And it was like a different planet for me, for a little French guy, you know, it was fun. And there was a beautiful smell that I kept for many years until I came back as a backpacker. And I realized it was Macca. The smell of Australia at the time, for me. So, once I came back in 1992, I decided to do something for myself. I thought I was going to stay here six months to one year, max. Thirty years later, I'm still here. Something must have happened. What happened is I felt totally in love with Australia. Really. I think I should have been born here, physically. I loved it so much that I decided to make my home. And I studied. I studied IT. I came from a hospitality management background originally, with my hospitality management school in Switzerland. But I decided that was not for me. I realized at the time that my true love was in technology. My true, my true passion was in technology. So I studied at QT, became a data network and cybersecurity engineer, and climbed up the road step by step with uh, at, uh, with state the bell, yeah? with uh, state uh, state government. Until I decided seven years ago to create my own business, and here I am. I guess I decided to run this year because again enough is enough. I am also the owner of a little small company, and the business has been hit hard by completely silly rules and restrictions. Thank you, Axel. So, that is it. That's, That's it. your time. Over time. But beautifully done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent. And joins us on this day for the rest of Thank you. From Dixon, the city member for Dixon, the federal electorate, Peter Dutton. Thank you, Peter Dutton. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here this morning. It's an important part of our democratic process. I want to say thanks very much uh, to Mary and to the Committee <coughs> Chamber of Commerce, which is uh, deeply immersed in our local community here and does a lot of good for uh, our community, but also connects uh, very well with local, school and local schools, and it's great to see the participation of our students here today as well. Also, I want to say thank you very much uh, to each of the candidates. It's not easy, particularly with social media, putting your hand up and copying the online abuse and the rest. Uh, so the fact that you're here standing up for what you believe in, uh, again, I think should be uh, respected this morning. Uh, I have been, as uh, the member of Dixon, uh, very focused for my time in Parliament on what we can do for what we can do for what we can do for the local community, particularly local schools, local infrastructure, the work that we've been able to do with the PCYC, uh, with the local all abilities park uh, here in the, the Hills District, uh, the work we've done with Patrick Trade State School, for example, for a new school hall. Uh, so trying to focus on the way in which we can improve our local community. Uh, I have a background as a police officer and also a small business person and I've been acutely aware over the last couple of years of what small business uh, has been through, but what families have been through as well during the course of COVID. With the assistance of JobKeeper, we helped save 700,000 jobs, including those in our own electorate. So I remember speaking to a local small business person here and pulling a couple hundred people. The advice from his solicitor and his accountant was to go into voluntary administration because they thought that during the course of COVID, they would not be able to keep the flight. And with the economic support that we've provided, we have been able to support those businesses and to turn our economy around into a position today which is the end of the world. Unemployment rate of 4%. It was predicted to be 15% at the start of COVID. So there's a lot that we can do as we come out of this, but we can only do it if we manage the economy well. All of the things that we need to pay for to support to keep our country safe, it's, it requires good economic management, and that's what we promise at this election. Thank you, Peter. Peter Dutton. Next up, somebody from Ryan, please. Who it's, it's Peter, Peter Cossar. Peter Cossar, And apart from uh, Peter Dutton, has the neatest haircut in the building. St. <laughs> Barbara. Good morning, everyone. My name's Peter Cossar. I'm the Labour candidate for Ryan. Look, I'd like to start by, of course, acknowledging the tradition owners in the land and which are holding this meeting. Uh, the Turrbal people this side of the river and of course acknowledge their elders past and present. Uh, I've been self-employed for 20 for 35 years working in the performing arts and building industries. I understand the uncertainty facing so many small, small businesses. You've been struggling for two years with pandemic lockdowns, staff shortages and decreased tourism, only to be hit by devastating floods. Small businesses need certainty. 
I come up from a family that understands hard work. My Italian father came from came from my Italian father came to Australia after the Second World War and worked as a cane cutter before starting a carpentry business. My mother was a registered nurse in aged care, and when I left school, I went straight into a building apprenticeship and got my ticket before being the first person in my family to get to go to university. I've lived in Rhine for almost 25 years with my wife and our two sons. I got involved in politics because I can see opportunities diminishing for my colleagues and my friends. Businesses are closing their doors, unable to keep functioning, and at the same time we're seeing gross displays of money for mates, sports rorts, car park rorts from the current government. This is why Labor has committed to a federal ICAC with teeth to get rid of the rampant corruption and waste use that we've been seeing from this government for the last 10 years. See, I want to be part of a government that actually takes responsibility and makes a positive difference to individuals and to small businesses that are the backbone of our community. And our Albanese Labor government will deliver a better deal for small business, providing certainly the small business community in times of crisis, ensuring that they are paid on time, cutting transaction fees at the point of payment, and make the government work for small business, not the other way round. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the Chairman for the Brian. Brian Dixon, next up, please. Your two minutes. And this is Alex Beback. Alan, sorry, yes. Axel here, sorry, Alan, Alan Beback. Well, that's... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, g'day. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alan Beback. Um, I do have a website, dixonindependent.info, which has all my policy and such like that. Um, so, on the screen, it will come up, so I won't rehash that now. I'll give you a chance to know what you is. When I... Uh, yeah, so when I left uh, high school, I knew roughly what I wanted to do, but not how to get there, right? I wanted to understand the world. So I ended up uh, going to UQ to study biotechnology and uh, join the Army in the Medical Corps. And uh, after, you may remember, Peter Beatty was the, the Premier, chased the biotech jobs out of Queensland, followed one land to Victoria. Uh, that uh, soon got pushed offshore as well. So uh, rather than follow it outside Australia, I... Um, actually enrolled at the Air Traffic Control College down in Melbourne. Learned to air traffic control like my dad. Uh, after a year into that, I knew it was definitely not for me. Apologised to my dad, so I don't know how he did it for, for 30 odd years. But uh, yeah, moved on. Called up to the university, UQ, where I had uh, done my biotech and asked, could I get credit for any of my, my subjects? Right, I'm retrained as a geologist to take part in mine. But uh, after that, I uh, basically did everything you could do as a geologist. So I worked in the environmental side, in, uh, you know, precious metals like gold, base metals, you know, copper, nickel, cobalt. Went into the energy sector, you know, in both exploration and production roles, moving into um, mineral sands and square earths, and uh, eventually into silica sands and construction materials. Uh, after moving on from geology, I guess I've um, gone to sort of project management roles these days. Um, when I was at university, I came across a Greek proverb, which is that uh, you should live every day as though you would die tomorrow. Spend your time learning as though you will live forever. So, with that in mind, I've continued to uh, study full time throughout my working career and I've picked up qualifications in economics and finance. So, what you can see is that uh, my experience uh, basically spans defence, biomedical sciences, aviation and travel, construction, mining, energy. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Be back. Independent. Interesting background. Now you get to rocks off on politics. Love it. And I love the fact you mentioned the, the philosophers, of course, Marcus Aurelius from uh, Meditations, um, famous Stoic philosopher. That's the whole thing about living every life, every day of your life, as if it is your last one. It's not the last day for... Who is next for Brian, please? Janine Rees from the Australian Progressives Party. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I'm lucky I live two minutes up the road. Um, I'm motivated to run as candidate for Ryan because it's my home. I've lived here um, most of my 52 years and plan on around another 52 more. Um, so I'm looking for good aged care uh, and, and good super. Uh, I want a fairer, safer, more equitable Australia. I want safe homes, schools, communities and environments. 
I want everyone to have equal opportunity to be successful. To do this, we need to rebuild our political and economic landscape to be a much more engaged, empowered and ethical democracy. We will do this by through a platform um, with the Australian Progressives um, built upon evidence, empathy and equality. I went to uh, Mount St Michael's College at Ashgrove, um, Alumni 86. I studied teaching at ACU at Mitchelton. Um, I've taught for a very long time now, <laughs> primary and high school. Um, I married, we bought our first home in Ashgrove. Um, I taught many years at St Finbars at Ashgrove. I have three beautiful children. Um, around the turn of the century, I created and of a small business with my then husband, a building company. Um, we renovated and built new homes. We built Eddie Francis home as well. Um, yeah, uh, my kids went to Mother Day. I coordinated um, for many years the Music in the Moonlight fundraiser, community fundraiser there. So I know many of the small businesses here have donated to Music in the Moonlight. Um, I coached my kids' netball teams at the Gap. Uh, my son played cricket at the Valleys and rugby at Jeeps and I'm now at Morris College at Ashgrove. So my roots here are very deep. Um, I also left a 30-year domestic violence relationship. Um, throughout, throughout that time, I was a, a victim of domestic violence. The price of leaving was the loss of my business and my home. Um, I started from scratch and that's why I'm running. I saw the um, broken systems that need fixing. Uh, so that's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. It's really like you haven't really done much today when you hear somebody like Janine who's been on the treadmill for 52 years. Well, I'm true. Thank you, Janine. Janine Reese from the Australian Progressives Party. Next up, for the seat of Dixon, it's Tamara. Tamara um, is representing One Nation. Thank you, Tamara. Are you ready? No. Yes, we're intermittent. Uh, so good morning everyone and a special welcome to the students. Um, it's great to see young people involved in politics. Uh, one of the things I've been hearing as I've been walking around is a lot of people don't understand our political system. So, my life. I started my working life in the Royal Australian Navy. From there I went to executive management in Asian disability, followed by the banking sector and also education. I've also had 24 years working in small business, uh, which I started and ran myself in tourism, hospitality, uh, sustainable acreage management, and now retail. So a little bit diverse there. I've lived in a multitude of countries, everything from communist Yugoslavia through to Vanuatu. I've worked in three countries, so I bring an understanding of cultural diversity to a representative role. I reside currently in the Sanford Valley, where I've resided for the last 15 odd years. I uh, raised my family there, and I also have my business there. Um, what else did I want to tell you about me? Um, I'm involved in community choir and also community yoga. I'm trying to keep myself uh, fit and healthy. Also involved in equestrian sports facilities and compete in dressage. As I have been walking around our community for the last three months, uh, what has our community told me? Our community has told me that they're concerned about their right to earn a living, they're concerned about affordable, reliable power, they're concerned about, more recently, very concerned about inflation and the cost of the weekly grocery shop, they're concerned about uh, sovereignty, and that one's come up recently in the last two months, uh, national sovereignty has been a real concern to them. Obviously, we've had many members of our community affected by government rules and regulations, and that has uh, divided our society, and we need to make sure that we get that division out of our society, and we get all people back to work. Is that 10 seconds? That's the final bell That is you. the final. And that was a nice way to finish. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm glad that you came out for those, because you have got this point. Can you give me some uh, tips on doing a handstand push-up? Yeah, don't do it with a shoulder. Oh, right, OK. Maybe that's too late. That's how I got a dicky shoulder in the first place. Try it. And what's the song you're learning in the community choir at the moment? Um, well, I've had to take a little break from community choir whilst I... Did your voice was, break? Uh, no, I have a key <laughs> crack, actually, in my voice. Um, but I have um, everything from 
um, musical South Pacific, um, up to opera. So. I love it already. Uh, to Mar uh, Tamara, sorry, Tamara Gibson, ladies and gentlemen, representing one nation. That was a part of Tamara's time, by the way. I was in this night, but tonight, that's what it was about. Uh, Ryan, who's up for Ryan? Elizabeth Watson Brown, representing the Greens. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Elizabeth Watson Brown. Thank you, Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Watson Brown. I'm really honoured to be a Greens candidate for Ryan. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge, as others have, that we meet on land stolen from the First Nations people who never ceded the sovereignty and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm a long-term Ryan local. It's where I've spent most of my life, where I've studied and taught at the University of Queensland, where I've built up my professional architectural business, raised my children and my grandchildren are here. And Ryan is very special. I think you all know that. Our mix of natural bushland, suburbs and high density inner urban areas represents a real slice of Australia, presenting both special challenges and I think opportunities. So as an architect, I'm especially interested in the functioning of our urban and natural environments and how designing the best balance there can support people and communities better. Uh, my own career has focused on sustainable design, greening our cities, urban resilience, accessibility and social equity. So a real through line there to Green's policies. I believe that no one in Australia should be without a roof over their head in a country with Australia's wealth and that well-designed housing for all serves our community and our society. I was inspired to run as your Green's candidate as I felt I just couldn't sit by any longer watching the future I felt being stolen from all of our children and grandchildren, not just my own. And I think Ryan has remarkable opportunities. We've got the people and the ideas to make a huge contribution to the advancement of Australia. Starting with taking real urgent action on climate change, we've all felt that very recently. Building a clean economy, fit for the future, making housing affordable, that's critical, and extending to, to all the outstanding education and health resources which so many Ryan residents can contribute. And what we're doing is very important, as I've always said to my students and staff about challenging problems. We're building the infrastructure of the lives that we share. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Watson Brown, Green. As an architect drawing a red line in the sand in Ryan. Thank you, Elizabeth Watson Brown. Next up, we have uh, Ali France, who is um, a contender for the seat of Dixon, representing the ALP. I think might be right, Ali. Morning everyone, um, my name is Ailey France, I'm Labor's candidate for Dixon. Um, uh, firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I really want to thank uh, the Hills Chamber of Commerce for putting on this wonderful event um, and getting us all together. I feel really grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Um, for those that uh, don't know me, this is my second time running in this seat. I live in Arana Hills, just down the road. I am a working mum to two teenage boys. Um, I got involved in politics after I lost uh, my leg in an accident. Um, I spent about uh, four or five years in and out of hospital and um, got very cranky about out-of-pocket health expenses, the costs of scans and tests, going to see a specialist. Um, and uh, I met a lot of people with chronic health, health conditions that were really struggling. My first job after that accident was for a palliative healthcare charity. I met a lot of people with terminal uh, cancer who were really struggling financially and I wanted to see change. Um, so that's why I am here and now I'm running for a second time. I really feel that um, there's a lot at stake this election. Um, I feel that we're at a real crossroads. Um, there's a crisis in our aged care sector. Um, we need action on climate change. We need uh, a federal anti-corruption commission. Um, we need to address wage growth and the costs of living. And we really need to transition our economy um, so that we can become more self-sufficient. Uh, Labor has a really positive plan for the future um, that addresses all of those issues. And I'm really excited to be able to answer your questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Is it rough being a journalist or in politics? 
Was it rough for me doing journalism or in politics? That's a tough question. Well, there'll be tough ones coming later. That's an easy one. We'll get to the tough ones soon. You'll be right. Okay, who's next up for Dixon? The sitting member for Dixon, representing the LNP. Right, I'm sorry, Ryan. Which, which side am I on? I'm impartial. Gillian Simmons. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian, and thank you. Good morning to you all. Thank you for being here today. Um, I grew up working in my mum and dad's small business, so I know how precious your time is, so thank you for giving it up uh, for us. I'm Julian Simmons. I'm the current federal member for uh, Rhyme. I've had the pleasure of working with many of you in this room over the last uh, couple of years. I grew up in Ryan, I've lived my whole life uh, there. I'm raising my uh, young kids uh, there as well. Uh, and before I was in federal government, I was in local government. I spent almost 10 years in the Brisbane City Council. Uh, and it's a passion of mine through local government and now through the federal government to work with local community groups, work with schools, um, to make sure that we upgrade our local roads to reduce congestion, to make sure that we protect our local lifestyle, and protect our local environment, and we do practical things that help uh, ensure that Ryan continues to be the wonderful place that we love. Um, being in federal politics over the last couple of years was a little different to what I expected. There was a few challenges, COVID and now more recently the floods. Um, but in all cases, we move quickly to support people. When we close the borders early in the pandemic, we save lives. When we put our JobKeeper, we save small businesses and we save livelihoods. And now during the recent flood, I've been out there supporting residents to rebuild and we've got almost a billion dollars out the door already to Queensland residents and, and a lot of that support came from our local ADF personnel as well. I work locally to try and improve our, our area. Uh, we have the upgraded uh, Fernie Grove Park and Ride that's happening at the moment in conjunction with that development so we can take traffic off Sanford Road. Uh, we're supporting our ADF personnel at Inogra with uh, better equipment. Uh, I've worked with the Gaythorne RSL so that we can help secure a, a new $5 million wellness centre. But there is more that I can achieve through my local plan. And with your support, I can do that. I can continue to support local businesses, reduce congestion, and protect our lifestyle. I'd love your support. And join the chamber if you haven't already. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Julian. Who is the team member for the lecture of Ryan? Let's go back to Dixon. Vinnie Batman, I met Vinnie in the car park for the first time this morning and he put a mask on straight away. I, I said, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. So I help you for your sign because Vinnie with the Greens, he was doing everything by himself. So let's hear more about the Vinnie Batman story for the Greens in Dixon. Sweet. <clears throat> All right, check, check, one, two. Hey everyone, my name's Vinnie and I'm running as the Greens candidate for Dixon this federal election. I'm a 26 year old environmental scientist renting in Debra and working from home, operating my small business in audio-visual audio conferencing, connecting people all across the globe. I grew up in rural New South Wales near Lismore, and was born with a congenital disability that made me aware from a very young age of the importance of strong public services like Medicare. It gives people an opportunity to reach their potential despite their surrounding circumstances. I'm running because I believe the federal government has let us down on policies that help out the average Aussie. You can see this in the recent LNP government budget, which spends more time focusing on short-term solutions that benefit the mega wealthy, I'm talking billionaires here, not mum and dad investors, and the corporations that donate to their election war chests. We deserve better, and that's why I'm running with the Greens. We need strong action on the climate crisis by investing in making Australia a renewable energy superpower, transitioning from coal and gas to prevent us going over 1.5 degrees warming and preventing more devastating and more frequent bushfires and floods, like the ones that just hit our region and my hometown of Lismore so hard. We need to tackle the housing and rental crisis of skyrocketing prices, of, of skyrocketing prices with well-designed public housing and rent increase caps. We need to get dental and mental health into Medicare. And we need to establish a strong federal ICAC to clamp down on the corruption and rorts we've become numb to constantly hearing about. The time has come to move on from nine years of this LNP government and put the Greens in the balance of power to keep the next government accountable on the issues that are important to our community. We need representation that prioritises evidence-based policy for long-term solutions, doesn't take millions in donations from the same massive corporations government's meant to regulate, and is focused on building a better future for all of us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Vivian. Vivian Green, Vivian Green, and Dixon. Trust me, Han is a sitting member from Ryan or Dixon. The <coughs> sit here, certainly, you can think about, geez, I'd like to have a reply, a reply right now. <laughs> politics, uh, I'm reminded with quite, uh, I saw recently about um, politicians having two faces. Abraham Lincoln said, if I've got two faces, why would I be using the one I've got? <laughs> Damien Curie has a lovely face and demeanour, and uh, Damien is the final cap off the rank for the Liberal Democrats in the seat of Dixon at this morning's forum. Damien Curie. Thank you, Ian. That's Ryan. 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 Am I left or right hand? <laughs> Thank you, Damien. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, election presents a great opportunity. One third of Australians say they're going to vote for a minor party, and that number is growing. <laughs> And now you have a sensible pro-business alternative minor party to vote for, the Liberal Democrats or Lib Dems. We're a party born of experienced business and community leaders fed up with the status quo who want this great nation to reach its full potential. I was a senior reporter and news presenter at Channel 10, 4BC and Triple M Brisbane. For the past two decades I've worked across the Asia Pacific region as a communications expert in crisis management. Good crisis management involves building community trust. It does not involve crushing people's spirit with dictatorial rules. It involves treating citizens like adults, not children. There is a better way. The Lib Dems are the only minor party option with a leader as experienced in government as Campbell Newman, our lead Senate candidate. Campbell paid the ultimate political price for trying to keep government small. And now we see he was right all along. Queensland has a bigger public service than WA, South Australia and the Northern Territory combined. And $120 billion in unprecedented state debt. Federal debt is nearing $1 trillion. The China threat is real and looming. Inflation and high interest rates are coming. Put me, Damien Curry and Campbell Newman in Parliament. We are the party that will stand up to over-regulation and red tape. We are the party that will fight for small business and smaller government and lower taxes. And we will stand against the nonsense of identity politics and entitlement that represents not compassion and kindness, as Labour and the Greens pretend, but division and erosion of the history and institutions that made Australia prosper. And without that prosperity, there could be no Medicare, aged care, community housing or environmental protection, the stuff that is truly compassionate people we all care about. Thank you. Thank you, Damien Curry. <laughs> nice soundbite. You must have blazed the trail for me at Triple M and 4BC. We never crossed paths uh, in media. You avoided me. You avoided me. <laughs> I was in Triple M when you were a big one of thrashing us. Well, you know, it was just one of those things I got lucky. <laughs> We have one more candidate for Stephen Dixon. On the far end, we have Thor Prohaska, who is standing as an independent in this election on May 20. Thank you, Thor. Ladies and gentlemen, Thor Prohaska. That Vinny turned it off. You have to do that. Thor Prohaska, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the third time I've stood as the independent candidate for Dixon. Many people would wonder why do I keep coming back as an independent? Because we have very little chance. If I was in Kuyo, it might be a different story. Now, I believe that your elected representative should represent what you and the majority in the electorate want, not what they or their party or the donors or their mates want. However, as Arthur Tresby, the Liberal member for Griffith, about 70 years ago, who was a constitutional analyst, uh, identified that once a candidate becomes a member, it is, their, it is the voters' responsibility to inform them, and he used the mechanism of will letter, um, to inform their elected member of how they want them to vote in Parliament. Now, it's a devilishly difficult thing to do to determine in real time what the electorate wants. Now, I have solved that problem and I've found with the Dixon representatives to trial it here in Dixon to see if we can make a practical reality. Now, it's all well and good to have a mechanism that um, allows 
what the people want. Um, however, at the moment, the Constitution has nothing in it that defines the relationship between the elected representative and the voters. And therefore, when the rep goes to Parliament, they can vote how they want. And even if the majority in the electorate say they want something, then they do not have to follow that. Now, in order to make that a reality, I have signed a Commonwealth statutory declaration declaring that if I was elected, that I would represent what the majority in the electorate want, and the penalty is four years in jail if I don't. Now, I don't particularly care. The member should legally represent what the majority want, and um, I don't care if it's Peter, I will vote for you, Peter, and I will put you number one on my head vote card if you go into a legal arrangement with the voters of Dixon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Thor. And Julia Tan to encourage. What happened? Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank once again the two minute exponents for Dixon, Thor, Biddy, Ali, Tampa, Alan, Peter, and Alina. And from the wonderful people of Ryan, we have Axel, Peter, Janine, Elizabeth, Julian, and Damien. Would you please thank them all for their time this morning? Thank you at home for watching this wonderful video with um, riveting stuff. It's now the audience's chance to deliver their questions to a member or, or members of our panel this morning. I want you to state your name and who you're directing your question to, please. If we can keep the questions down to 30 seconds and our panel will have a minute and you'll get the bells as well and the whistles to uh, answer the question. Your name, please, sir, and who you are directing your question to. Hi, I'm Alan Chenoweth from Barton. I'm directing uh, my question to... And please, up on the microphone, Alan. Sorry. Directing my question to both Peter Costa and Julian Simmons. What is your party's long-term vision, I mean beyond the next three years, for an Australian economy that will benefit all Australians? <laughs> <laughs> Peter going first. Yeah. So our party's aspiration, well, our party believes in bringing back manufacturing in this country. We've seen it decimated in the last 25 years, um, and I know that a plan to bring to reconstruct it, reconstruct it, or bring back our manufacturing is absolutely vital to us. We've seen through COVID how decimated we were by not having manufacturing in this country and a decent supply chain. So that's one, I think, major priority. The other one, of course, I think, is to make sure that we actually have sustainable jobs leading into the future. So our Powering Australia plan will make sure that we have what well, has been independently assessed and will create 600,000 jobs. And along with our manufacturing plan, five out of every six of those jobs will be in regional centres. See, we have opportunities here. And what I've seen in the last 10 years Oh, it's a minute, so short. It's 10 seconds, you get a 10 second thing before the... Oh, right. It's the still the same. Oh. 10, you seconds. 10 seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. <laughs> you got 10 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Julian, thanks very much, Ian. Well, I look, I'm very grateful for the question because the economy is at the heart of everything we do. We need a strong economy if we are going to roll out the strong services for aged care and health and education that we all rely on. And that's why the government, and will continue to do this in the long term, which is what you asked about, will continue to keep the economy strong. We will continue to focus on lowering taxes. It is absolutely in our DNA. You've seen that, seen us do that over the last three years and longer, and you can be guaranteed that we're going to continue to do it in the future. And we're going to continue to create more jobs. We've made it a promise to both keep taxes low and to continue our focus on creating jobs, um, because if we can do that, we can keep the whole economy strong. We can keep small businesses like yourself pumping uh, by things like the instant asset uh, write-off and lower taxes, so that you can continue to grow and you can continue, uh, continue to generate the jobs, because we know it is you that is the engine house of the economy, and so when we get the big ideas like the NBN and the NDIS, 
we can make sure that we can find those important services that are important to uh, our local community. Thank you, Julian. Peter, I hope that answered your questions. Just uh, your name and to whom you're addressing your question. My name's Hugo. Thanks to all the candidates for coming out today. My question is for Julian. Your government failed to deliver an election promise or even debate leg legislation for a federal life hack. And you can't blame Labor because you need to, especially after promising, bring it to Parliament. So Bridget Archer, crossed the floor on this issue. You've never crossed the floor for your electorate. Always voting for the likes of Barnaby Joyce. Do you promise again to deliver a federal life hack, but this time with the appropriate powers to stamp out corruption, or should I vote for someone else on this issue? Sure, and no, look, I really appreciate uh, the question, uh, and I certainly do support a federal ICAC, as we supported it last term. And we have done the work in order to achieve that. We have over 300 uh, pages of draft legislation that has gone out to comment so that we can talk to stakeholders about getting the right model. But a federal ICAC has to survive the short-term politics of a three-year election cycle. We want something that, that um, the LNP and the Labor Party can come together on so that we can work together in the parliament to put in place a federal like act that will survive and won't be changed depending on who is in the election. Now, right now, we favour a model that is closer to Queensland, uh, Queensland's model. So in the Queensland model, you have um, uh, hearings and then uh, a report is released, though I know Jackie Chan is trying to stop her report being released currently. Whereas in New South Wales, you see very public hearings and at the moment a, uh, uh, a charge is made, there's public hearings and that can destroy people's careers overnight. So that's what we're arguing about. The Labor model, which is closer to the New South Wales public kangaroo court hearings, or our model, which is closer to the Queensland Government. And we'd like, Thank if we you. get re-elected, that we can take that mandate forward for our model. Thank you, Julian. Julian Simmons, thanks for your questions, sir. We have Dixon over here as well. We can take some questions. Not much as first one, it's one from the Chamber. That's right, Peter, I've got it. <laughs> um, we'll direct this to uh, Tamara representing One Nation in the seat of Dixon in the federal election, where will you or your party, this is from a member of our chamber, where will you or your party be directing your preferences and why? So, as we all know, uh, in the seat of Brian, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, that was yeah, great. That was a great voice. <laughs> as we all know, in the seat of Brian, we are going to, Brian, Dixon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, did you get it right? <laughs> Left and right hand. Um, <laughs> We have eight representatives on the green paper, so the House of Representatives. I would like you to put me as number one, obviously, and the rest of the, the preferences are your preferences. So I would encourage each and every one of you to look at each and every candidate and see which of those candidates most aligns with your values and what you want for the country. That's what I would like you to do. As a, as a member of One Nation, we are saying, put the majors last, they haven't served us well and then look at your independent and our minor parties and work out which one of those candidates you want to put second, third, fourth and fifth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, next question, please, and I believe it's John. Uh, can I say once again, uh, on behalf of everyone in the chamber and our panel this morning, thank you very much for uh, Fernie Grove High School for giving you guys the time to come out this morning. Now, John just got an A. It is John, isn't it? It's, it is John, yeah. Um, I've got the light on here. The um, governor in humanities, and he would love to, and he does uh, a bit of art stuff as well. So, John, your question's going to be brilliant, I know, and he has ambitions one day to be sitting up here on a panel as a, a politician. I said, why? <laughs> John, your question, and to whom you're delivering? Uh, my question is to Julian Simmons. <laughs> Um, I found articles published by The Guardian post that private schools throughout Australia are receiving up to $3,338 in handouts per student compared to $703 for public students. Whilst the education is primarily the responsibility of state governments, do you have any plans to provide state schools with more equal funding within your respective electorates? Thank you, John. We'll go to Peter Dutton first. John, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Julian pointed out before, the first point is that we can't pay for education and we're increasing funding in education uh, to the states. We're unable to pay for the NDIS without a strong economy. We're unable to pay for public hospitals, unable to pay for the local infrastructure that we need without a strong economy. So the first thing we need to do is to be able to 
run a strong economy so that we've got the funding and the finances to be able to support your school and many others. As you point out, the State Department of Education here in Queensland has responsibility for state schools, primary and, uh, and secondary. We provide funding and increase the amount each year uh, to the state uh, governments, in this case Queensland, and we want that money spent wisely within schools. In private schools, parents make a contribution by way of their fees, and there is a differential, obviously, in the way in which uh, you would want that treated as opposed to the way that we treat it. So our judgment is that if parents are making a sacrifice and making a contribution, that should be in addition to the funding that we're providing. Thank you, Peter. Julian. Thanks, thanks very much, and I'll just add briefly to what the Minister said. Obviously, we have significantly increased uh, funding to the Queensland Government for uh, state schools for education, and that's because we do have a strong economy. So if not enough of that funding is, is flowing through to the students on the ground, well, that is something that we want to make sure is happening with the Queensland uh, Government. But we also strongly support the freedom of families to make the choices that is best for their family. And that means we want to support all educational institutions um, because families will make their own choices about whether the, uh, the state school system or the Catholic education system or the independent school system is best for their families. And when it comes to my belief in government, my belief in government is that we should be facilitating uh, those choices that families make for themselves and for their own kids. Thank you, Julian. Julian Simmons. John, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thumbs up for John. Politician. <laughs> Another student from 30 Grab High School. Your name, young man, and uh, I'll hear you right, Cliff. I'll ask you. Thanks for having us today. My question is just directed at you, Minister Peter Darden and Benny Barden, if that's all right. With the IPCC, the International Authority on Climate Change, an expert, releasing a report this year that it is now or never to take drastic climate action to prevent a climate disaster. And with climate change being a key issue for young voters, what drastic actions do you plan to support if you were to be elected to the House again? We'll go Vinny first. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I am an environmental scientist, um, not a climate scientist specifically, but an environmental scientist. Um, and for sure, my biggest passion in getting involved in politics is to um, represent Australians and young people particularly in facing the climate crisis head on. Because you're right, it's the biggest threat that, um, that we face. Scientists around the world are in, in consensus about that. So we need to focus and hone in on policies that prevent warming of over 1.5 degrees Celsius. And at the moment, both the LNP and Labor don't have suitable plans for that. They are both on the same page with opening 114 new coal and gas um, sites across Australia. That's new. And we think it's a better use of our time and resources to be talking about how we can transition out of these sectors while taking care of the workers to, um, to transition into the renewable sector and be able to make Australia a renewable energy superpower that um, gives us a new uh, pillar to our economy in the, in the, in, in the context of renewables. Thanks. Thank you, Vinny. Peter Duck. It's not sure, oh, it is working. Uh, uh, Oscar, thank you for your question. It's a very important issue. Uh, all of us agree on the need for uh, climate change action to be uh, transitioning into sustainable energy uh, sources that the, the, the point of difference we might have is the trajectory, if you like. So uh, the government's committed to, uh, to a program which uh, we're meeting the milestones on and we'll continue to do that. I think your argument is that we should get there more rapidly. Uh, the, the difficulty is that, uh, I mean, we, we all could be strongly in favour of uh, EVs, for example, a uh, hot topic, and we can all purchase EVs tomorrow. The question is when we go home at six o'clock at night and plug our vehicles in, whilst we you know, get ready for dinner, take care of the kids, whatever it might be. I mean, is, is, that, is that realistic with science where it currently is? I, I don't think it is, that's the problem. So we need to be realistic about, it needs to be realistic about the load on the grid uh, because the grid uh, would not cope with that if there was a mandate for everybody to have an EV, which would be part of your plan. Uh, so we need to get the balance right and very strongly supportive of electric vehicles. Uh, for, in this example, we're sort of out of time, but. Uh, that's the, uh, it's, it's, it's a question of what science can accommodate and what we can do in reasonable time without closing down businesses in this room. 
Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Oscar, for your question. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Vinny. Norway doesn't have sales tax on their electric, electric vehicles at the moment. I thought that's a, the sales have gone through the roof. You wonder if think we can knock sales tax off EVs in Australia. We're doing it. We're, you're not even there. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the next question comes from? Uh, I'm Kerry Levingston from Eaton's Hill. Thank you, Kerry, for your question. I have a question uh, for Ali France and Benny Batten. All of Moreton Bay is internationally Ramsar listed wetland. Wetlands include lakes, rivers, swamps, floodplains, estuaries, coral reefs, mangroves, shoreline salt marshes. Can you demonstrate that you understand the importance of Ramsar wetlands like Tunda Harbour and their connection to the Dixon waterways? How will Labor protect them? Thank you. Ellen. Sorry, I missed your first name. My first name is Leanne Kerry. Leanne. Call me Kerry. Okay, Kerry. Um, thank you for the question. I think it's an incredibly important question. Um, Labor does have a plan uh, to protect our environment into the future. I think um, over the last 10 years, uh, there's been a gaping hole in policies to protect not just our natural um, uh, wildlife, but also our habitats, which are just so, so important. Um, I think uh, one aspect that we will be doing is changing the EPBC Act, um, the Environmental Protection Act. It's been a long time coming. I know that um, the current government uh, proposed changes that would hand the power back to the states. I think we need to have a wholesale review of that act and make sure that we make the changes that can actually uh, protect our um, beautiful flora and fauna um, and our habitats. Um, I'll hand over to Vinny now, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for that question. Vinny, your response. Um, yep. Uh, yeah, thank you so, so much for the question. Um, yeah, so obviously uh, when we're talking about uh, wetlands, you know, it's, uh, it's clear they're a uh, crucial ecosystem that we need to uh, protect at all costs. And obviously one of the huge tensions is development versus conservation of areas. But when we're talking about areas like wetland and, you know, the contribution that they have as far as um, uh, a sink for carbon dioxide, and um, the uh, types of species that can only exist in those areas, you know, we need to be protecting them um, above uh, at all costs, I, I believe. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, factoring in the fact that, that they are an ecosystem that is that has so many unique species um, and uh, is such a sink for carbon, I think that uh, we, we must get that balance right. Uh, so yeah, and I also definitely support Ellie's approach um, on that. Um, around uh, state protection for those areas as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Next, please, your name and to whom you are addressing your question. Uh, yes, my name is Jen Basham. I'm addressing this to Elizabeth and Julian. Uh, this region cares about conservation. A lot of Brian campaigns have highlighted this in particular. Yours, Julian, and your support for tree planting, etc. One of the biggest Queensland commitments now so far for economic development is $483 million to the Urata Dam project, yet reports have suggested it will flood 6,100 hectares of forest. The business case assumes a sustained increase in coal production when the International Energy Agency suggests a decline of 57% over the same time period, and it's unclear if it will make a return on investment or perhaps it could be as low as 26 cents in the dollar. Do you support this project? What do you say to these concerns? Or what would you suggest in an alternative economic development project? Thanks for that. Yeah, ready now? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that question. It goes right to the heart of what we Greens think is the right direction in terms of economic development for Australia. And that is supporting clean energy and supporting, uh, as someone mentioned before, green manufacturing jobs. We actually have an amazing opportunity in Queensland and Australia to do that, and that is the way we're going to have a thriving economy in the future. We cannot have it without real action on climate change. The Urana Dam is going in the opposite direction, in my view, and certain elements of it do not pass the pub test either. 
So in my view, real action on climate change equals a thriving future economy, equals the way we look after everyone in Australia. It's very clear that is the way the world is going. We cannot stop the fire of this urgent climate action uh, that we need right now by pouring petrol on it. And I'm afraid that is what both old parties are doing at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, Julian. No, thank you very much for the question. I have to upfront declare that my wife works for the Iran Game Project. Um, so I, that's, I'm, you probably knew that because it's been in the press and it's on my register of interest. So of course I would excuse myself from any decision making process around that. Uh, so I would simply make the overarching comments that new projects have to stack up, they have to go through the environmental uh, process and they all have that standard, whether it's uh, uh, national environmental approvals or whether it's Queensland government environmental approvals. And you're quite right, I do focus a lot on protecting our local lifestyle, making sure that I work with those local community groups who are um, undertaking bush care work, work or under, uh, undertaking revegetation, make sure they get the funding that they need to make sure that we are undertaking practical environmental measures like you know putting solar panels on the local kindergarten and all the rest. But all this helps to contribute to the fact that we are on a trajectory to get to net zero by 2050. That's where we want to be right now. We're meeting and beating our targets. And I strongly support those efforts and we'll continue to make sure that we do what we need to do locally to be part of that solution. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for your question. Next, please. Your name. Thank you. My name's Guy. I'm from a southern suburb of Brisbane called Melbourne. Uh, we might have done that again. We've got to come from somewhere. I don't know if that's me. My question is for Peter Kosser and Damien Curry. A um, trillion dollars in public debt, 200 billion in coalition pork. Is there any way that the coalition can now present itself as a fiscally responsible party, especially from a Liberal Democrat perspective? Thanks very much. Damien? No. Um, I don't think so. I think there needs to be a radical change inside the Liberal Party, especially. Um, I think the party has drifted from its core values. Uh, they're not standing up for business anymore. They're not being fiscally responsible, running up a trillion dollar debt. <coughs> trillion dollar debt is inexcusable. Uh, COVID or no COVID. Um, it really is extraordinary to be able to the charts. It's just extraordinary that we could be in this position. A trillion dollar debt as interest rates rise, which they're going to in the next few years, is going to mean about 50, possibly to 100 billion dollars per year in interest only repayments. Now, that's about, uh, I think, one third, a quarter to a third of the uh, entire income tax revenue of the nation, and it's also about one tenth of our entire federal budget. So we're in real trouble. Thank you for raising the point. Uh, and, and it needs a serious fix, and we've got to focus on getting the cost and size of government down, regulation out of our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, look, thank you for the question. We went through COVID, and what I thought the Liberal government did was find to put money out the door with in terms of JobKeeper. Unfortunately, they put no regulation in it and no decent oversight, which is why $20 billion of that went to companies that actually didn't lose or to their, their incomes didn't decline. That's where it gets really problematic. At the same time, they're the highest tax in government since, uh, since Federation, is my understanding. So for me, that you're actually right, their economic credentials are out the door. But we, it's not just about economics, it's about what we've got to show for their time in government. There are no major infrastructure projects. There is actually nothing at the end of, out of all this debt that they have created. Thank you, Peter. Next question, please. Good morning. Thank you, Guy. Good morning. My name is uh, Abraham Harris, not Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I'm a... The resemblance is there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am uh, a sole practitioning solicitor. I've been practicing now for 20 years, so my question is directed at the uh, major parties. Can we trust that the question will be the truth? Sure, it will be the truth. Nothing but the truth. <laughs> um, I've been active for people with significant disabilities for a lot of that time. Um, I'm often coming across with my clients and their families two issues they find with NDIS. The first being the complicated assessment process uh, for funding, which often results in overfunding for things they don't need, underfunding for those that they do. The second is the rotting by the service providers. What I'd like to know is what the government's intent, or what 
the government and my party attempt to do it related to those two significant issues. And so whom are you addressing your question? Oh, uh, to Peter Dutton, uh, to Julian, uh, and perhaps to Ali as well. Um, Adrian, thanks uh, for, your, for your question. I mean, the important point to make about the NDIS is the numbers have ramped up very dramatically, as you would have seen, if that's your area of practice. Uh, so there are 517,000 people in the NDIS at the moment, which is up from 277,000 just in March of 2019. So in terms of the scale and the scope, and there is a lot of pressure from within the community for uh, more conditions to be recognised, more people to come within the scope of the NDIS. So you point out uh, a very real issue, that is uh, how do we keep NDIS sustainable and how do we make sure that we provide support to those who are most in need and not uh, over-service those uh, in cases that you've pointed out. Uh, there's certainly a significant amount of compliance uh, within the NDIS and uh, there are some providers who are exemplary and others who are not. And the question is, uh, you know, gathering all of that information from you and others across the whole country, we're now spending more on NDIS uh, than on Medicare, and that's an investment in the people who deserve support. Uh, we want to make it sustainable by addressing some of the concerns that, uh, that you've rightly raised. Thank you, Peter. Ali, did you want to say something? There? Thank you so much for the question. I think um, what is happening to the NDIS is actually quite heartbreaking. Um, I speak to people with a disability almost every other day. Um, there are people who are having their plans unilaterally cut in half um, with no discussion or consultation um, and being told that if they wish to um, challenge decisions that they have to go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, um, which in itself is an incredibly stressful, time-consuming process. When they get there, it's them against a whole heap of lawyers. Um, which in itself is a waste of money. Um, we have already announced that we will do a review of what is going on uh, with the NDIS. It has become overly bureaucratic, and um, I think it's straight away from the intent of a user-driven system. Um, you cannot have families um, and people with a disability having their um, services and their care cut in half without discussion. It's, it's disgraceful. Thank you, Alan. Director of Dallas, thank you for your question. You want to direct one to Janine. Janine, uh, this is from the Chamber. Uh, what is you? Uh, what is your or your party's plan, the Australian uh, Conservatives? Uh, who, uh, <laughs> progressives, sorry. Who don't wish to be vaccinated to return to work, especially teachers and healthcare staff. Do you have and healthcare staff? Um, I'm a teacher. <laughs> uh, teaching and education has forever changed um, since the pandemic. Uh, we learned a lot of new skills and we found that we were all very resilient. We've had that word often. Um, and we and the you know this the students are amazing. So when we're looking at jobs of the future, we've got um, we've got creative, um, collaborative. Um, communicative, beautiful people coming through. Um, so we've got it, we, we're investing, we need to invest in, in our future. Um, nursing uh, as well, we, we saw teachers and nurses are the frontline workers. Um, you know, we need to address the pay gap. It's, it's highly um, gendered work. It's, it's traditionally women's work. Um, so we need to, to look at that. Um, but I think we're heading back into um, the normal, day to day that we've, that we've had, but things have forever changed. So, um, yeah, we, yeah, it's it's a, a new world and an exciting world. Thanks. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette. I'll just uh, pose the same question to Alina. And uh, Alina, your thoughts on, I'll repeat the question for you. From the floor, uh, what is you know, your plan or your party's plan to allow people who don't wish to be vaccinated to return to work, especially teachers and healthcare staff? Awesome, thank you. Um, so our plan is to basically end the mandates and let everybody back to work. I mean, what are we up to? Our fourth shot now? Yeah, I haven't had one. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, oh, <it's> <laughs> um, on a 
honestly, four shots. Israel's up to their eighth and ninth shot. They're not working. I mean, and you can still spread it if you have it. Why are you keeping people out of the healthcare industry when you have six hour waits in emergency departments and people are dying? They're not getting the care that they need, but you have a whole sideline of like, people that have been side sidelined ready to go back to work. It needs to end. And we will, if we get in, we will be introducing a Bill of Rights where you, you can't be dictated to about what you put in your body. Because when you mandate medicine, that is a death sentence to some people. Everybody has different genetic dispositions. We are not all the same. You cannot blanket mandate medicines into people's bodies. Thank you, the leader from the United States Party. I was vaccinated for the fourth time and I'm not working. Or is it not working? No, <laughs> right, no, I'm not done. Uh, I haven't got, no, I haven't got, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of people have had it and uh, it's on to go. My 98 year old mum, who's in aged care facility, got it last week and sharp as a tack and uh, nothing wrong with her hearing. Pardon, pardon, pardon. Um, but she loved to boast that I never felt more than just having a head cold. 98 years. Your question, please, sir, and uh, who you're addressing to. Hi, my name's Ash, and my question's directed to Ali. Ali, what would you do to make sure that our strong water protection policies that we have now stay in place? Uh, and if Peter would care to respond after that. Ali? Um, as we've said... Hello. Um, sorry. Um, as we've said uh, many times, and I think um, Malbo outlined um, at the recent at the recent debate, we support we support boat turnbacks and offshore processing, um, the same as the LNP does. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. But there is a marked difference. Well, Peter. <laughs> but you can have a crack as well, Peter. You know. Just get in line. Here comes a poor invitation, but still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your question. It's an important uh, issue for us because, uh, as we know, uh, at the moment, uh, whilst we have the boats on the water, uh, people smugglers are trying to put people on the boats out of Vietnam, out of Sri Lanka, and this problem hasn't gone away. People are uh, not prepared to pay money at the moment because I don't believe under our government uh, they can arrive, arrive successfully. We have stopped the deaths at, on, on water. We have got children out of detention. We've closed 17 detention centres and we don't want to go back to those days. The Labor Party has now had five different positions on border protection policy in this election so far. The latest announced by Penny Wong last week. The, re the reality is that the central pillar He's not turning back boats, it's not sending people to offshore detention, it's temporary protection visas. And the Labor Party's been very clear that they don't support that because if you have a boat that's listed, that uh, the border force officers have arrived to, and you're risking those people out of the water, they hop onto the Australian vessel and they're in the waters uh, under Labor Party policy, they get a permanent protection visa, they don't go home. And that's what the people smugglers sell, sell. And that's what we've broken the back of and we don't want to see ever a return to that. At the same time, we've been able to bring people in in record numbers through the humanitarian program the right way. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter Dutton. Peter Crusher, I think you had a word on that. No, it's all good. It's all good. Quite a man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. So, Vinny, you weren't included, Vinny, but if you have a microphone in front that's working and you've turned it on, thank you. Uh, I'll be really quick. I just... You will be. Yeah. So, <laughs> If we are at current, you know, breaching our agreement as a country on human rights by the way that we are treating refugees. Thank you. you know, we, <laughs> yeah. Um, it is clear that, and I'm sorry to just bring it back to this point, but, you know, with climate change, more and more people will be displaced from their home. Refugees seeking their conditions are only going to increase. We need to have real honest conversations about what it means to be humane in the way that we treat refugees while also keeping our country safe. I understand Labor's been wedged on this issue essentially because the coalition has made such a demonising policy out of the way that we treat refugees and turned it into this, this 
this really inhumane conversation about how we treat other human beings. And I think that we can, I think we can have a conversation about refugees that aren't just about that our security is dependent on locking them out at all costs. So I wish that was in the conversation a little bit more. Thank you. Your question, please, ma'am, and who you are directing it to? Judith Hydock. I'm, I'm the chair, chair of the senior, senior committee. And I'd like to ask this question of Peter Crosser. Peter, if, 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 Peter, if, if, if you were elected, oh, uh, would you create a, a, a position in Centrelink for the branches specifically to assist, assist mature aged people to help fill in application forms. Some are not com computer literate. And do you understand their needs? Look, absolutely. And I think you're, thank you for the question. I think you're absolutely right. Within Centrelink at the moment, we do not have the, the uh, public service or skills or ability to actually help people. In the, in, and we've seen the same thing across the NDIs, which is why it's not working. They, they, these guys continually cut from that part of that part wanting small government. Well, the price of, of cut, making no that small government is you actually lose expertise and the ability to actually help people. You know, I lost mum in aged care last year, and that system is so under threat. Um, she was in a really good aged care facility, but still they were understaffed and there was no registered nurse on, no registered nurse at all through through the palliative care process. This has to change. And we know that it's actually an economic driver. If you've got an RN 24-7, we won't have people actually going, or uh, the aged care residents actually going in ambulances to hospital to actually have a pill. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jim, for your question. Yes, please. Um, Lynette, Lynch, Hills. I'd like the Labor Party and the Green response to my question. And, um, because we're doing quite well with time, if Peter Dutton wrote a chance to reply to, that'd be great. Um, it's on live export. So uh, I don't know what the Labor Party's uh, policy this time is in relation to live export, so I'd like some clarification of that. And I'd also like to know what's going on with the wine back of the summer sheep export back. The last part of your question. What's going on with the wine back of the summer sheep export back? And you're directing your question to? I'd like the Labor Party and a Green response. Okay. Ali? Um, I need to do this. Sorry. <laughs> I get to turn it on every time. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I know that, the, that some of the news items um, a couple of years ago were really distressing for people looking at those live um, export, you know, at the way in which animals were treated in. in um, transporting them overseas. Um, we haven't announced a policy as yet on live exports, um, so um, I'd have to go away and, and check in on that for you, so sorry about that. Um, but I understand that it's an issue for a lot of people. And Elizabeth to respond as well. Hi there, yeah. The Greens are against live exports. That's all I need to say about that. Yeah. You can check the details of it, and I would say this to everyone to do this, to go to Greens, so we'll put the very comprehensive policy outlines on our website and you can drill down to any of the policies that you're interested in and they're very clearly set out and easy to access. Thank you. Thank you Elizabeth, thank you for your question. Uh, next question, was that the, you have another one? Could Peter respond? Peter has a response? Well, Vinnie has a response. We have a response from Elizabeth. Vinnie. Yeah, um, just quickly, um, just to kind of tie it all in. I, I definitely wish we were having more conversations about, you know, animal rights, I suppose, because, you know, it's clear that we have a huge agricultural sector within our country that's not going to change. Um, and I think that it's good to have honest conversations about what it means to have animal rights as a, you know, priority without necessarily looking to demonise or take away from our agricultural sector. So I think live export has underpinned a good conversation, you know, that people do care about animal rights, um, but obviously it uh, yeah, shouldn't be framed in a way that's uh, meant to demonise our farmers who do important work um, for our country. Um, so I'll hand over to Peter on that note, I suppose. Yeah. A couple of points. Uh, I mean, firstly, n none of us want to see uh, animals uh, 
abused or treated uh, poorly at all, and, and neither do farmers. Uh, when you speak to farmers, they're horrified by any suggestions of abuse of their animals. I know Mark Fern has been involved in this for a long time at the state level. Uh, this issue, of course, came to prominence a few years ago uh, when the uh, live cattle export uh, ban was put in place overnight uh, with a very important trading partner. Uh, the Labor Party uh, you know, ultimately reneged on that and apologised for it. But uh, what we've done is to put in place uh, additional vet resources, uh, standards for both cattle and sheep, uh, to make sure that uh, there is monitoring and standards that, uh, that need to be met so that the sheep and cattle and uh, other live exports can be treated humanely. But uh, without those live exports, some of those markets close, don't become available to farmers here in our country, and uh, it's not my proposal to close down either of those, those two industries. Thank you. Peter Dutton, thank you for your question. Thank you for your, your responses. And the next question, please. Remember, we have uh, some independence here in Axel and uh, Alan and Thorne down the end. So if anybody has a question to uh, direct to these uh, gentlemen as well. And ladies, thank you. Your question. Good morning and thank you. Is that off? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, my name is Dr. Hannah Warser. I'm a specialist in looking at the lived effects of policy. Um, especially, I have been looking for the past six years at asylum seeker policy under the Liberal and Labor governments. I don't want to ask my question in relation to that, but I will make a comment that billions of taxpayer dollars have been used to put people in offshore detention and to live on temporary visas, and people still haven't stopped coming. coming. They've um, simply drowned at sea. It's just not being reported. Is there a question? My question is that a strong economy is important, but it's underscored by a strong community. I'm a teacher, too. And they are inextricably linked. Literacy is currently backed by volunteers teaching people to read. My question is to the Labor candidates and the Liberal candidates on both sides of um, Dixon and Ryan. Um, how are they going to help education be improved in our society when you don't have a choice, as Julian Simmons said, we had a choice about where we had to send our children. Is this question coming out in book form? <laughs> no, that's it. How do we get our children to have a decent education when they don't have a choice? Thank you, ma'am. Peter. Well, we had a very, very extensive plan last night ago, a few elections ago, called Gomsky. Needs based funding for education. Now, it didn't get up. It didn't get up. Each one of each of the states started to take their own little bits out of it. I think we need to go back to a model like that. Needs based funding for education in this country. Now, we've lost, what is it, around 40,000 places, 40,000 teaching jobs within the university sector. The university sector is, is inaccessible to a lot of people, especially with the new fee restructures away from humanities. I did a humanities degree. Surprise, surprise. I actually lost teaching work because of the way that fee restructure happened. You know, and, and I know that young people are now doing, paying 40,000 plus to get an arts degree in this country, and those are the issues that are really important to people. We actually need, we're actually going to add $20,000 to university places to start with, and I think we need to look at a needs-based funding model for education. Thank you, Peter Gusser. Julian Simmons, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your question. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, the fact that people don't have choice. They do have choice. Families in our area uh, have the opportunity uh, to send uh, their kids to very good state schools, to very good Catholic schools, and very good independent uh, schools if they want. But the economy and uh, education are inextricably linked. That is the reason we have been able to increase funding for education so significantly during our time in government. Um, because we have had the settings in place for a strong economy, because we have had the settings in place that will allow small businesses like yours to grow and prosper, and that increases the tax base, and that allows us to pay for these increases in education. And I want all taxpayers, all parents, to be able to, inch, uh, able to have um, government support for the schooling choices that they make in the best interest of their families. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, just to, to thank you for your question. Would you, um, Axel just has a couple of responses on some recent questions as well. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, other excellent questions indeed. And the Australian Federation Party is a consultative party. So it's based on what 
people want, not just once every three or four years for elections, but ongoing, continuously. Now, I've heard some issues that have been raised about climate change. We want to focus on mitigation. I mean, climate change, it seems to be involving a lot of problems. One of them is the pollution that we are fighting every day through our lives. I mean, just let's take an example the masks that people have been using for the last year or so. That corresponds to billions of miles that have been literally, literally loitering the planet. So mitigating these kind of issues rather than just trying to change the planet, because we don't have this kind of power, right? I mean, we're looking at the CO2x. I need a bit more than that. Okay. <laughs> So this kind of issue actually needs to be mitigated, not just uh, dealt with with a, with a sledgehammer. Thank you very much. Excellent. Next question, please. I have a quick announcement. Can everybody please use the QR codes and give us feedback, what you think of this morning, and add that in the handstands over there. Good luck with that one, and for me as well. Yes, please, sir, your question, and then you're addressing it. Thank you. My name's Ross McCain. My question is uh, for Alina Ward. Alina, in your introduction, you mentioned um, the deregulation of the dairy industry. Um, given this occurred under John Howard's LNP government when your lead, Clive Palmer, was a, um, a large member of the LNP, how does your party now plan to change this? Um, look, I'm not going to lie. Obviously, Clive has been with the LNP for a long time. Um, but people have the ability to change their minds. And when you can see that injustice is being done to people and to agriculture and to your country, you have the right to change your mind and jump ship. Um, that is called evolving. And that is a really important part of politics. And um, unfortunately, a lot of politicians that we see haven't evolved and don't evolve and are still doing the same thing. I mean, he's jumped on a ship of freedom and he's supporting people, Australians. Like, he's Australia for Australians. I mean, he's actually quite patriotic, regardless of what you think of him. Um, but I mean, I. People love to do a good character assassination of him, but I mean, if you're going to do that, do it to all of them. And he doesn't even make the top ten when you do a character assassination of our party leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. He does a pretty good assassination himself. <laughs> I'd love to see him jump in shit. Big tilt. <laughs> Alan uh, has a couple of thoughts to uh, one of our independents uh, in the seat of Dixon. Alan. Did you want a question? Yeah. I won't give you one from the floor, from the Chamber. Now that we're in the recovery phase of COVID-19, what would your plans be to repay the debt that the government has incurred? Is uh, this thing on? Yes, you um, So, the, the economic models actually that the NLP put out, they're actually pretty good. I and mean, if you compare them to, to previous governments, right, that, um, which is not the hardest one, we'll compare it to, to John Howard right, when uh, how we left office, unemployment was about 4.5%, now it's 4 odd, so better. But, um, you know, participation rate, for instance, uh, no participation rate, that is, was 65% uh, back then, 66% now. So with these, these numbers stacking up pretty good, why do uh, so many people, I guess, in the middle and working fastest feel like their, their goals are getting away from them, right? So um, the, the debt that's come on, that uh, the government's taken on, we're... I don't see that actually as being the uh, proximal cause, right? But um, a couple of years ago, the government sorry, uh, reduced the amount of money that's required uh, for the deposit on, on a loan. So this has actually multiplied the uh, fractional reserve payment system, right? So instead of being six times multiplied for cash, it's now 20 times, right? And uh, so this huge amount of inflation has come from that rather than the government debt is what's driving up the, the prices and the cost of living. So my plan would, uh, you know, that it's basically eliminating some of the nuisance taxes. I do go through this uh, in extensive detail on my website, dixonindependent.info, and uh, you, this, this increases the prosperity, it brings in more tax revenue, we get the form of uh, company taxes and individual taxes as well as earning more money. Thank you, thank you for your response. Thank you, I'll be back independent for Dixon. Yes, sir, uh, your question, please. So my name is Richard Langford from the Romero Centre, which is an asylum seeker support centre at Dutton's Park. Uh, my question is for Damien. 
Um, as I've moved through the community, uh, both business and wider community, there have been many people who have expressed their deep concern about the destitution, the homelessness, and the mental health issues that are silently that people face while living in our community waiting for assessment. My question is for you, because you talk about compassion, how would you see that we could be more compassionate to these people who are already traumatised to be able to at least give them some quality of life while their assessments are being made? Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, in relation to, to the uh, asylum seekers, uh, the question comes back to uh, the, the technicals of the, of the legality of their, of their being here. But while they're here, we've got to ensure that they're not treated like prisoners. Um, so I, I do have, I'm not an expert in the field in the area, I'm sorry, but I would look into it very carefully if I was elected because I do have some concerns about how that's perceived overseas as well as just humanitarian concerns, obviously, about treating people properly. Um, Obviously, the philosophy of my party is to reduce the size of government. That doesn't mean that we reduce the size of supporting community services. It means that we believe that the community itself will manage more efficiently those community services. So we would be involved in the process of funding organisations that know what they're doing, rather than having massive government departments. We've seen what happened with the NDIS is by now. now. Um, you know, it's just it would be better if the government supports education and supports these social services with uh, by allowing the community organisations who know what they're doing uh, and, and facilitating organisation rather than trying to run things themselves. Thank you. Uh, that's our focus. Thanks, man. Thank you for your question. Yes, please. The next question, and uh, does anyone have a question for Thor and or please as well? Feel free to uh, throw one or jump on the end of the queue. Thank you very much. Ben, your question, please. My name is Jill Warren. I'm a manager at um, a local community centre called Pickabean, just located in Mitchelton. My question is around um, social housing or affordable housing for people. Um, I just want to uh, preface the question by um, saying that recently I have met people who have become homeless um, due to either mental health issues or to uh, affordability. So what um, um, what can be done about this, and how can people stay in touch with those real issues? So I'd like to ask Peter Dutton the question, and also Valerie Franks. Well, thank you uh, for, for the question. Thank you for the work that you do at uh, Pickabane, which obviously is a very uh, important uh, uh, organisation within our community, and whilst in Ryan provides support uh, right across the two areas. So uh, the federal government obviously provides a support to the state government, as you know, um, you work closely in the seat with the state governments and a different, uh, you know, right around the country, it's got to be said, have success and, and failure in, in social housing. So we provide our funding to the states. Some states, I think, do it exceptionally well, others are lagging behind. And uh, in Queensland, you know, to be fair, it's a mixed bag. Uh, we provide support through rental assistance, uh, which the state government doesn't provide to people who are on welfare payments, for example, on those uh, including uh, migrants, uh, including people on aged care pensions, etc. Uh, and we provide that support uh, directly to them uh, to provide uh, them with the opportunity to, to go into housing and to supplement the support that the state's providing. So predominantly it's a state issue, but we provide support through the states. Thank you, Peter. Ali. Uh, thank you for your... Thank you. Thank you for your question and, and the important work that you do. Um, obviously, this is a huge issue right across Australia. Um, we're hearing more and more of people, uh, women and children fleeing domestic violence who can't find places to go um, and in, are, are staying in dangerous situations. Um, I think uh, women over the age of 50 are the fastest growing uh, homelessness group um, across Australia. Um, I think uh, the federal government needs to take more of a leadership role in this. Um, we have announced that uh, if elected, we will have a uh, national housing fund. Uh, we've committed, we do need to build more social and affordable homes. We have to. Um, we have committed uh, to building 20,000 uh, more social housing, uh, including 4,000 homes for uh, women and children, victims of domestic violence, and also 10,000 for uh, affordable homes for frontline workers. Um, this is a this is a real issue across the country. It's very important. Thank you for your question. Thank you.
So obviously, you know, the need for public housing and homelessness being on such a rise is that we're in a dramatic housing crisis, you know. Prices have ballooned out of control. Um, you know, a lot of people my age have given up on the idea of even owning a home. So it's clear that we have a crisis that we need to address there. Um, the Greens have got a comprehensive plan around building one million homes across the country, 750,000 of those being beautiful, well-designed, fitting in with the, um, the look of the local area for social housing to get on top of the, the ballooning waiting list that we have because it's just completely uh, unsustainable and out of control. But it is a broader, uh, it's, it fits in a broader context of these ballooning housing prices. And the fact that we're treating housing as a commodity above, you know, somewhere to live first and foremost. So we want to keep conversations around negative gearing on the agenda. We're saying that we're saying that for people who own more than one investment property, that negative gearing should be scrapped and phased in. You know, we're not going after mum and dad investors here. We're not after people who just want one, one investment home. We're after people who are driving the property market as a for profit model and making housing unaffordable for the masses. It's just not okay. Thank you, Vinny. Vinny from the Greens. Um, Janine want to say something in response to that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'm one of those statistics. I was made homeless through domestic violence and I was a homeowner for 26 years. I am a degree, I had a small business. Um, so we need laws to, um, to end domestic violence so that um, we don't have this, the crisis of women over 50 being our highest homeless statistic. Um, we need affordable housing, but we can also support women to and children to stay in their homes. So at the moment, there's no um, government support. Um, there's there's no housing. I, I was on a waiting list, um, I don't know how long. Um, there was no rentals at the time that we were made homeless. Um, so we were lucky that we found a rental here in Capera after four months of having to stay with family and friends. We were lucky we didn't have to go to a refuge, but um, you know we've seen with the pandemic that um, crisis happens to anyone and everyone um, and we need supports, government supports to help. Thank you, Janine. Uh, Peter Dutton just would like to say something about that. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to add to my answer before, just given that uh, domestic violence uh, elements being introduced in, into the conversation. One of the reasons that we have a uh, bit of discussion, a discussion about debt this morning, one of the reasons that we do have a high level of debt at the moment is we put a significant amount of money over the course of COVID into both domestic violence services, so for uh, refuges, for uh, the NGO sector to provide support, particularly where people have been you know, forced to isolate uh, in a home environment uh, where there may be domestic violence, and also uh, to address mental health issues as well, which, uh, of which there is a greater prevalence over the course of COVID. Uh, again, as a result of the pressures that people are under in confined spaces, uh, etc. We, we've also, though, put a lot of money, a lot of support into uh, the, uh, uh, there was some com uh, comment about it before, uh, but allowing a smaller deposit uh, of 2% where the government underwrites the rest, uh, so that women in particular who come out of uh, relationships and don't have the finances that they put out earlier in their working life uh, to be able to go into the purchase of a house. So it's, there are a number of ways in which you can provide support uh, for, uh, for women who are victims of domestic violence uh, to go into housing and secure housing, which is a fundamental right and there's some of the ways we've been able to provide that support. Thank you, Peter Dutton. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Um, Thorne, we've got the question. Sorry, Peter. My, my question is, why didn't you do that during COVID? We've got a $20 billion black hole in JobKeeper. Now, if you'd spent that money actually creating social housing and affordable housing, we'd be a lot better off as a country. Yeah. Well, with, with respect, Peter, it's, it's an issue that's above politics, I might say, and it's bipartisan support of the federal parliament on the work that we've done. And we've worked very closely with the states and territories, as you know, during the course of COVID. It's been exacerbated during the course of COVID uh, because of, as I say, people having, by state mandates, state health mandates, the requirement to stay in a household where there is the potential of domestic violence. So the money that we've provided 
has been ramped up considerably over the course of COVID and remains in place and will continue uh, at that level, at that very high, much, much higher than, uh, than you know, we've known in any time in our history. And uh, you know, all of us feel very passionately about it, but it is not a political issue. And the money that's been provided directly to those services at a record level, and in, indeed to the state government for public housing, but also to help people into their own loan so that they can go into their own home uh, to provide a you know, roof over their heads uh, for, for them and for their children. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Peter, as well, for that. Does anybody have a question for our mate down the end, the independent standing for Dixon? We have uh, Thor, uh, who would love a question from the floor. It's got, do you want to jump? Can we jump the queue for Jonathan? Just well, Sir, so you've been waiting now, I know. Sure, Barry's ready to wind up. That gentleman's been waiting a while, but Thor's been waiting also. So, Jonathan, uh, your question, please, to Thor. Um, hi. Um, as you stated earlier, you believe that local members should represent their electorates rather than the interests of a political party. To what significance do you think political parties interfere with the representation of Australians in federal parliament? And how will your plan help to change this? Thor Pohaska, your response, please. Thanks for the question. Again, going back to Arthur Tresby, 70 years ago, he was a constitutional analyst. He determined that the political party's role was to identify people who were suitable to be members of parliament and to put them forward um, for the voters. Once they had chosen the representative, the political party's role ended there. Uh, how would we do this? Well, Basically, we're going to develop a community, uh, a network of community reps, because most people do not have the time, inclination, or capacity to be involved coming up to an informed decision on the bill. So we wish there's 108,000 people in this electorate. We want to crowdsource the expertise of people that used to work in fields, have a passion, have an interest, and out of that, we will get a consensus on a bill and that bell has just pulled me off. <laughs> <laughs> you are too short. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for your question. A uh, question from the man with the Pinky Blinders cap on. We thank you very much, sir, for your fashion statement this morning. And your question is directed to him. Uh, Red Amy and uh, Aslina Ward and Mr. Duff. Oh. What's your name, please? Grant Amy. Grant, thank you, Grant. Uh, I want to talk about Foreign ownership of the ports, of Australian ports. Foreign ownership of Australian ports. Where does Clive keep his big hill yacht? <laughs> Alina, please. Um, I'm not a professional or a, um, on the case, but I do know that Clive, well, not even Clive, our party doesn't support foreign ownership of ports just because then they have control over our resources and they can control when they can and can't come to us, and that is how communism starts. So, you know, we're all for local owned, Australian owned, Australian manufactured, Australian everything. So, I mean, look what's happening right now. We're selling out our country, essentially. We've been sold out to China. They've got an airstrip in Western Australia. They can bring things in and out without telling us. They, they have full power to do what they want. Like, that's scary. That's, that's people that live under communist rule that are able to bring things in and out of our country and do things that we can't see. It's not transparent. There is no transparency in this government. There's so much going on in the background that they're hiding from us and it's just foreign ownership of ports and anywhere really allows that. I know that, Peter, that comes across your portfolio. Minister Dutton, your thoughts on that? I, I suspect uh, the, the comment relates specifically to, to Darwin government's announced that we've got a review underway, uh, which has been commissioned by uh, the National Security Committee to look at uh, the ownership arrangements in relation to the Darwin Port. The options are uh, that there are conditions attached to the ownership, there's divestment uh, of that uh, asset or a continuation of uh, the current ownership. Um, let's make this general point. I mean, we have a very important trading relationship uh, with China. We want the relationship with China to be normalised. Uh, we want nothing more than peace in our region and uh, we have to be realistic about what we're seeing in the Ukraine, what we're seeing 
uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, with the foreign interference in our own country and uh, in other countries in our region. So it's a very real issue. Uh, if there was a proposal to purchase support by a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise or one affiliated uh, that's made to the government today, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that wouldn't be approved. But that doesn't mean that uh, foreign investment into our country is a bad thing. Uh, it's helped underpin the success of our economy and the reason that we're in a strong position today. So we have to take decisions primarily in our national security interests, but that doesn't uh, mean that we need to exclude people or undermine uh, one of the fundamental elements of uh, the success of our economy, the, the reason people uh, in employment uh, have jobs, etc. We're a trading nation, we're a small nation of 25 million people, and we have to continue to trade. As Clive, uh, uh, I mean, with all due respect, I didn't understand the answer before, but I mean, Clive has made his billions of dollars off the back of exporting uh, minerals out of this country into China and elsewhere. And uh, the royalties have come back to support schools and education systems and all the things we've spoken about before. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Tamara Gibson uh, for One Nation in Dixon. Thank you for that question. Yes, thank you. Um, infrastructure investment is really important in this country. Foreign investment is really important in this country. Foreign ownership is not the same thing. If you go to many other countries around the world, you cannot buy a home. You can invest in a country, if you look at Malaysia, I think it's, you're not allowed to own more than 49% of something. So you don't have a controlling interest. With due respect, Mr Dutton, um, it was the Liberal Party that leased out the Port of Darwin. So uh, to have a review is all well and good, but it was your decision to do that. Our view is that water resources, major infrastructure, specifically <coughs> strategic infrastructure, needs to stay in the hands of Australian-owned companies. Major interests, uh, things that are going to impact on our ability for say, sustainability and defence need to stay in Australian hands. Foreign investment is fine, foreign ownership, not so much. Thanks for all. Thank you, Tamara. A uh, question from the Chamber to uh, Ali uh, for Dixon, ALP. What infrastructure building and other practical initiatives do you support to help in dealing with natural disasters, fire, flood, drought, uh, cyclones, etc.? And how will you work to implement the uh, changes that you feel are necessary to be able to cope in a, in a country with all of those elements? Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think this um, microphone doesn't like me. Um, <laughs> then he keeps um, turning it off. I've got a point. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, I think um, what we've seen over the last um, few years in terms of floods and fires and natural disasters has, has, has really demonstrated the need for mitigation and the need to be spending more money on flood mitigation but also um, fire um, mitigation. I think. Um, what we've seen over the last uh, three years, uh, we've seen the government uh, sit on top of a $4 billion fund that has just effectively earned interest. Um, we could have been spending that money on flood mitigation um, and on uh, helping people in the communities impacted by fire. We've made a commitment uh, in terms of a um, disaster recovery fund um, and we will make sure we will get out the door 200 million a year on flood mitigation um, and also supports in terms of um, disaster recovery. Thank you very much, Ali, for your response to the investment from the Chamber. Bob, it's really great. Price skill, your name and your question, please. Hi, I'm Jasmine Peters, I'm from um, so it's recently been brought to our attention that people in non-traditional relationships and families, so same-sex partners and multiple parents, they struggle in the property market because they struggle to get home loans. This has happened in my family recently. Do you, anyone, I'm addressing this particularly to Peter Dutton and Ali France, but anyone else who has some information on this, how are you going to combat this? How are you going to allow for non-traditional families, which are a growing population, how are you going to allow for them to get the home loans they deserve? We might you know, we just heard from Ali and Peter a fair bit, so we might go down um, to somebody from Ryan to respond to this. Julian, would you like to respond to that? Sure, ha very happy to respond. Uh, look, I'm not aware of that particular situation, but I'm very happy to speak to you um, after this uh, and understand that. I mean, I sit on the Economics Committee and uh, in Parliament, we get the opportunity to uh, question the bank CEOs regularly about these sorts of things. Uh, I I've 
I've made particular progress on something that I'm passionate about, which is abusive messages via banking platforms. So I'm very happy to raise that um, with the banking CEOs myself. If you can give me the example of where they've struggled, um, because I mean, obviously, as a government, we don't want to see that discrimination. We've worked hard to remove it from legislation, and if that's still permeating within something as important as our banking sector, we want to help you address it. That's what we're here to do. So we'll talk after. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you for the Fernie question. And um, do we have time for a couple more? Um, Godfather, all things Mr. Chamber. Two more, and then the president to wind up, please. I wasn't addressing the question to you, Brian. <laughs> I was just to Mary. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> your question and your name. Hello, I'm Sue Woodward. I'm parish priest at Indrapilly. I have a question. Uh, for the Vine candidates, particularly for Julian and Peter and Elizabeth, the Centre for Public Integrity has reported that a billion dollars has been donated to political parties between 1999 and 2020 without source being known. We're aware of different amounts of spending on political campaigns with figures, um, say that Clive Palmer was spending up figures up to 70 million in this campaign. I speak to people who are very concerned about the impact of this spending on democracy, and I'd love to ask for your opinions on how you perceive this as a threat to democracy or the future of our democratic process with political donations. Oh, sorry, thank you. I'm going to get the line. Uh, look, absolutely. We, well, I can tell you for a start that I don't, I don't take any do uh, developer donations, I also don't take any donations from anybody other than other than branch members and people who actually want to, want to, want to donate to the campaign. Now, we have a $1,000 real-time disclosure, so anybody who gives us an amount over $1,000, that real-time disclosure goes into the AEC um, within, I think it's three days. So we, we, we address that in, in uh, Queensland State Parliament, so we follow the state Queensland State Parliament regulations around donations, so that we are, we, we don't do the federal one, we do the state one, okay, when we, when we campaign in Queensland. But look I, I, look, I understand your concerns around that, but people should also have the ability to, to, to donate to the democratic process. That's also, that's, also, that's also large companies as well. They have the right to actually do that. The problem is when they, when they start getting you know, uh, you know, money from mates, that's when it becomes a problem. And that's why we need a federal ICAC with teeth. I believe we have a central need for a federal ICAC with teeth, and that is because the two old parties do take massive corporate donations. We as Greens do not. And those massive corporate donors expect a quid pro quo, or they expect a return on our investment. And this is why this system is absolutely corruptible. We only accept personal donations. So we're now in an environment where millions and millions of dollars go into the coffer of the two large corporatised parties. In return, we as taxpayers are subsidising, for example, the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $12 billion a year. That's you and I are doing that, and there's very little return for that. Many of those billionaires do not pay tax and take their profits offshore. So that is ultimately undemocratic whether there's an argument about corporations but having the rights. So that's our, that's our fundamental problem in Australia and we are working to change it through our actions and through our promotion for a federal ICAC with team. Thank you, Elizabeth. Julie. Thanks very much, uh, Ian. Well, I don't equate donations to those things because we also support, uh, as taxpayers, renewable energy as well and there's significant donors to these uh, deal independents uh, with strong renewable energy who seek to make a lot of money off those policies. The other people that, that Peter did mention is unions that he takes donations for, and of course if they're not, you don't class them as mates, I don't know who you do, what you do class them as, and you deal an IR policy. So I think the important thing is that we all follow the rules, uh, the same rules that are set out in terms of disclosure and all the rest of it, as I myself do. I'm not like the Labor Party where they can just get a union to write a cheque. Everybody who donates to my campaign does it because they're convinced that I have a local agenda that is worth supporting. Um, and certainly, uh, that does, so that doesn't equate for anything any more than it would equate to your IR policy, Peter, when you take very significant donations from the unions. Thank you very much, Julian. And Damien Crew from Liberal Democrats in Ryan. 
Thanks, Ian. I just wanted to make a, a, a quick point that I support everything that Julian said just there, but also I think we need to liberalise even more. Um, I, I think everybody has a right to spend their money however they want, and if they want to support a political candidate, we have to go and prove ourselves. I'm new to this process. Um, I can disclose that my budget for my campaign is about forty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on whether I get to the fifty. Um, but I, I would like to just ask the question of Elizabeth: Where are you getting all your money from? Because you've got a lot of money, and you're saying you're not taking donations above a thousand dollars. But the Greens, if you have a look in our area, the number of Greens, I can tell you, it's a it's a six figure campaign that you're running advertising wise. It's not quite six figures, but we have actually got donations from people who are keen to make the radical change and the immediate change that we need, and they are all personal donations, and they are disclosed. So we've just been very successful at fundraising because people want the change that we are offering in this space. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the spirited discussion and debate. And so your final question this morning, thank you. My name's Jeff Moore, and I've got questions for Janine and Lydia. So my question is, it's actually been borrowed from the very first question asked, summarise your party's long-term vision for Australia. Janine? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, our long-term vision is we are looking at job creation, we are looking at a federal ICAC, we're looking at ending DB, um, we're looking at um, putting money into education, health. Um, we don't have the access to funds uh, that the major parties have, um, but innovation, is, is probably a key area that, that we support. Um, small business, we need to, um, you know, we have a wages crisis and small business growth and wages go hand in hand. So um, as a, I know the time and effort that, that we put into our businesses um, and we're families, we have um, children, I have three. Uh, so our long-term vision is Human centric, where you know we're looking at um, supporting each individual, each unique individual um, in our community, and that's my vision would be to be a representative of, of our community. Of Ryan, thanks. Thank you, Janine. And Elizabeth's going to be very quick. I'm going to be very quick because I'm going to reiterate that equation I mentioned before: immediate real action on climate change. That's for the future survival and the thriving of the young people, that generation that we have with us today. So. Real action on climate change equals the way we have a thriving economy. If we do not act on climate change, we will not have that. And that equals how we support everybody in our community, all of the vulnerable people we've been talking about, and the future for the young people. That's our plan. Thank you, Elizabeth. I love your blink now, Polish. It goes well with the microphone. <laughs> uh, very quickly, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the um, questions this morning. Uh, the responses from our candidates for Ryan and Dixon. And I might really, really quickly get uh, Damien two words to sum up the 2022 election campaign, or three words, but no longer, and quickly because the bell ring is going to go crazy with this off the planet uh, question. The greatest opportunity we've ever had. Thank you very much. Julian. Uh, I need your support to continue to deliver locally. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, no, I don't have to do that then. Oops. Immediate change and immediate uh, uh, action on climate change essential for survival. Janine? Equality, integrity, climate action, and um, demand better. Peter Cossett? Opportunities for all. Axel? Change the way we do politics, change is here, and we're going to listen to you the whole way. Alina, thank you. Uh, more jobs, more Australian made. Thank you, Peter Dutton. Keep our country strong and safe. Alan? That our government requires better voters, so research your candidates and make an informed decision. Tamara? Australian owned, Australian made, and Australians first. Ali? Labor for a better future. Yeah. Vinny? Don't turn my microphone off. <laughs> Evidence based policy that supports real people, not billionaires. And Thor? Australians need to reclaim the floor of Parliament. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you put your hands together and thank our candidates who put their hand up and said, I'm going to stand in my seat because I want to do something for others. So 
Thank you, Thor, Vinny, Ali, Tamara, Alan, Peter, and Alina. Axel, Peter, Janine, Elizabeth, Julian, and Damien Curry bring up the rear. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you at home for watching our video this morning, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed the entertainment, the spirited uh, debate from our uh, members of the panel. Thank you for the Hills Chamber of Commerce. I'll now hand you back to Mary. Thank you very much.